Hey everyone, welcome back to Better Biomed. Today is going to be an interesting video. It's something that's not very often that you're going to do this, but it is still a function that you do provide, and that is incident investigations. Now, there is some interesting things when you have an incident, and one of those interesting things is that all things associated with that incident must be quarantined, and a disinterested party, me, uh, will come in and do the investigation. If you are the biomed that takes care of this device, you should not be the biomed to do the incident investigation. You can tell today we're in San Antonio. We're over at College Biomedical Equipment Technology, and they have graced me with some of their test equipment, which is all calibrated and it's all set and ready to go. And we are going to do an incident investigation on this guy right here, ConMed. And I know it's old, guys, but it's a Excalibur Plus. It's still a workhorse. They're still out in the field. But uh, there is some stuff to be wary of. Now, some backstory. Apparently, when this happened, there was a doctor who was doing a surgery and there was a scrub. And the scrub was leaning over, making physical contact with the patient while grounding herself out on the, on the surgical table. And apparently, what had happened is that there was a set of non-bipolar, just regular uh, forceps that had come in contact with the surgical scrub nurse and uh, there were some burns that were left on her while the doctor was activating the ECU. Now we have a whole lot of grounding questions associated with that, but the surgical table, the room, whether or not it's isolated power, all that comes into play. This is the only item that they've asked me to investigate, and that's where we're going to start. So uh, like I said earlier, everything that's associated with this device needs to be quarantined. So this is it. I have the ESU. It is hardwired, so this is the original power cord that came with it. If, if you have a non-hardwired power cable, like this guy here, you need to make sure that you acquire the power cord. It is an essential piece to the investigation. I also have a monopolar and a bipolar foot control. The reason you want the foot controls is because it is possible that there's fluid intrusion or something on the foot control and it's causing an internal short, which also means that, let's say the doctor lets off and he doesn't think he's activating the ESU, he could still technically be activating the ESU if there's a short in the foot controls. These are not digital foot controls. These are analog with this particular model. Some of the newer ones have digital foot controls and you won't have this problem. But with the older analog ones, any sort of short, which could be maybe a bad cable or fluid got inside it, could create an activation under false pretenses. So, Guys, the first thing that you want to do with a device, because we're not going to plug anything in until we actually do a physical inspection. And if you see any irregularities, like let's say drop damage, a beat-in corner, if you see a cord that has been damaged, if you see that there's an impact damage on the display, anything of the sort, you stop everything. Then the device needs to be packaged up with all the stuff and sent to the manufacturer. Because at the sign of physical damage, now you have internal components that could be problematic. They might show up normal during normal use, but if you shake it a little bit or something, you could have a loose capacitor or a loose semiconductor, and that will be an intermittent failure. So that's why we ship it off to the manufacturer, to which this one here, I don't even think the manufacturer would do anything with, which is why we're doing it today. So first case, physical inspection. Now this is a non-molded plug. So we're gonna to have to do an electrical safety. That's one of the first things that we do. And it's clear, so I can actually see that. It looks like I have a really good connection. I have no mars, no rips, no tears, no, no flat spots in the cable. Power cord is hardwired. So that part of it is good. Now uh, on the foot controls, this here is a little sus, okay? When you have something that's bent at a hard angle, you could have internal where the conductors are meshing together. That's something that we can and will check later. Uh, it looks like a standard foot control. They're disgusting. Sorry guys, I'm not buying gloves. Now the bipolar. However, there's a couple things to note for the bipolar. I've got a loose bottom pan. Oh, look at that. Took nothing for me to do that. And I have right here, another hard angle. That is a no-go. All right. So this foot control here could be part of the problem. I don't think it is. So one of the things you want to do before you plug it in, if there's an incident, is do a thorough physical inspection. 
There's two fasteners on the back that I have removed. And that brings the front cover to its resting position like so. And you wanna make sure that there's no fluid that's been coming in on the front panel because that could also create problems. And you wanna look for signs and traces of fluid that might've got inside of the device. Again, they're talking about burns. If you talk burns, you have grounding problem and or you have some sort of seepage of electricity from this device out into the patient care environment, which you don't want. So on closer inspection, I've got relays. Mind you, this thing is not plugged in, guys. Um, all my caps seem to be well fastened to the board. My main transformer is fastened. The cables are really old and starting to get funky. I've got a large capacitor in the back. It's all fastened good. Your shorts can happen from semiconductors if they are overheated and they will give you physical signs of overheating. So over down here, we have a series of them. I think they're IGBTs. And you see this one up here, this diode. Um, this guy is obviously getting hot. You can see that the uh, thermal compound is discolored, whereas all the other ones are the same. However, I do not have any burn fuses. Burn fuses mean something shorted. I don't have any. I think this guy is going to be safe to plug in. So let's go ahead and set it up. I have the Rigel Unitherm. It's going to help me out. We're going to set it up next. Okay. Before we plug a medical device into a very expensive piece of test equipment, we're going to first do an electrical safety. We want to make sure that this case is not leaking a whole bunch of electricity out. Oh, if I even back on normal. There we go. How about that? So electrical safety. When you do an electrical safety, the first thing you always have to do is your ground check. So it is currently connected properly. And we first we want to move around at both ends the cable to see if it changes. I'm at 62.62 uh, .62 of an ohm, or no, 0 0.062 of an ohm. So um, we are actually sitting well within uh, our tolerance. Mind you, it can go up to 300. So 0.3 of an ohm, we're at 0.062 of an ohm. We're good. So uh, this guy here, eh, it's my, my outlet that's actually a little, little jacked. So we're good. Next thing we're gonna do, we're gonna go to uh, external case leakage, to which then we're going to, it's off. We're currently, we're at zero, open the ground. I'm at 15 microamps. Then we turn the device on. And it barely went up at all. That is the first good sign that we've had all day. Okay. So I am at 0.7 of a microwave. Yes. And let's go ahead and open the ground. And remember before it was 16 or something like that microamps. I am at 18 microamps. So we are doing really good. Okay. So the device passes electrical safety uh, just for... Sakes, because this is hardwired, let's go ahead and reverse the polarity and let's go ahead and check it there. 19.8 microwaves, we're, we're absolutely fine. Okay, so the guy is set up, electrical safety is fine. Now I know this cord, I've already physically inspected it. I can now plug it into the wall and let's hook up our unitherm. And next we're gonna do some energy checks. Okay, the first test that we wanna do is our REM or CQM, whatever these manufacturers wanna call it anymore. Um, it involves your patient return electrode. It's the number one safety feature on ESUs that keeps the patient safe. And in this case, it would also keep the med staff safe. So uh, since they were saying that there's a burn on the arm, if the med staff actually got burned by this guy, then there's a very good chance that the patient would have been burned as well. I've never used the Rigel unit before, but it is very intuitive. So right here on the main screen, we can go into REM. And then once you go into there, uh, then I told it to go to manual because I like doing things manually. And um, so we're at zero ohms, which means dead short. And when you're on a dead short with this one here, this is for split pad electrodes and it should activate around eight to 10 ohms. Anything less than that, this guy should give me error codes. So we're gonna go ahead and connect that guy up. Um, I do have two gator clips over here that are connected it here. Let me just support this cable. They are separated, so I do not have my dead short. And the way that these old machines work is you used to have to select between single pad and dual pad manually. And then when you select and you had a return fault, you would then have to click monitor set to reanalyze the circuit. 
Now, all new ESUs are constantly analyzing the circuit. The old ones, you had to tell it manually when you got a return fault. So that's what we're gonna test right now. We have the manual up and let's go ahead. We're at zero. It clearly will not go on dual pad. You see it's got an alarm. It has an alarm, it is not happy, right? Single pad, it's happy. Because between dead short and about probably seven, eight, nine ohms is when it's happy. This is a dual pad, so it is definitely not happy right now. So we're going to go ahead and increase resistance right here. I, now, Rigel, guys, I really wish that you would have this numeric a little bit larger. Because right here, it's tiny. Like, see that right there? It says five. This is its cap, 517 ohms. So right now I'm showing good. And what we're gonna listen for is when this guy has a return fall. Okay, so I went up just a couple ohms and it threw a return fall. So I got the eight ohms, it says return fall. Now I put it on dual pad, click monitor set, see how it's at the low end of its tolerance, but it's okay. Now, as I turn the dial up, when we go up above, if I increase a certain number of ohms, it's different on every model, but as I increase the ohms and this guy senses it, it will throw a return fault. So let's see, 10, 11, 12, there it is. So I increase just three ohms, four ohms, and it throws the error again. So that tests us, it knows what it's doing, it's got accurate measurements. Now what we wanna do is we got, wanna go to the upper limits so while it's in return fault, I'm gonna take this guy all the way up. Almost every ESU that I know of caps out at 135 ohms. So we're gonna go ahead and go to 130 ohms, come over here and hit monitor set. Shows that we are in the high tolerance, dual pad. And let's go ahead and turn it up, 132, 133. Now, if I click this one more time, it should error, 134. 135, whoop, it's getting close, 136, 137, 138, 139, 140, 141. Now that is at its highest tolerance. So this guy, at this moment, it is above its acceptable range, usually. Um, and that means that we'd have to do a calibration on the REM, which that's easy, we can do that. But it, the important thing is to know that the scale is changing. It does know where it's at on the scale. See, there we go. 145 says we're at the high, yep. 145, it's maxed out. 140, it's within tolerance at 140, which that's a little too high. But it does tell me that this is working. So now that the REM is working, now we can go in and we'll set it up. We're gonna do cut and coag and then we will go and we'll do some bipolar. So coming up next, let's go ahead and set it up and we'll do some energy outputs. Okay, so uh, to their credit and discredit, uh, Rigel, they do have a show diagram, which believe it or not, it does coincide with the side bit over here. So this over here is just for shorting purposes of the foot control or for activating it, which I really wish these were the ports that we'd plug in for testing because it's a little odd to be on the side, but at least they have a diagram. This is so awesome. So uh, I currently have it set up. Go back. We are set at 300 ohms. We're on monopolar in cut. I guess it really doesn't matter if it's cut or coag because that just activates different foot switches. We are doing manual activation off of the knife. All right, so we have everything set. We're gonna hit start. Look at that, we hit the big old green button. We are at 300 watts, cut 120 coag. Let's see what we get. Okay, we've got 265 watts uh, on cut and coag. Coag. Hmm, is that my passive? No, it takes a pretty defective here, guys. Okay, we'll do it with the foot control. I have a defective pencil. So with the foot control, I have 
Nothing. Okay, guys, we brought out the old trusty 454 Alpha from Fluke ESU Analyzer, and I absolutely love this guy. It's got really clear numerics, um, very easy to use, more importantly, but it's also a, a set of continuity. So if I got certain results with this guy, uh, we tested uh, high frequency leakage, we tested the output, the output was a little bit low. Um, so we'll whip out another calibrated unit and we're gonna run it on this guy. So Luke 454 Alpha, uh, we have it set at 300 ohms. Let's go ahead and do a run. One of the things I love about the 454 Alpha is that it's always on. I don't have to say start test, it's always on. Look at that. Uh, so on this guy here, I had 265 watts this guy here, I'm getting 267, so it's 269 at 300 ohms. Not too bad. All right, so let's go ahead and test the coag. Defective pen. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. Hmm. You got a problem? I have no, no coag. Yep. Okay, guys. So, um, one of the things that I've noticed is that I kept thinking I had a defective pen. So, this is why you should always have more than one consumable at your disposal. Ha, ah, unintended. So um, in port one, I have nothing on coag, nothing. In port two, I have coag, look at that. So there is one hardware issue already. Um, so I gotta figure that guy out. We got something going on over here on uh, monopolar port one um but let's go ahead and do an output on port two they should be in parallel inside so it doesn't really matter what port i'm connected to but it is definitely a problem if you guys are doing pms be cognizant of that so uh let's see 120 watts 119.1 that's what i'm talking about spot on okay guys so uh cut and coag let's go ahead and half value it so Let's take uh, coag down to 60. Okay, and let's take that 300 down to 150. So what we're gonna test is the linearity of the system because it should be able to scale effectively. So 150 and 60 half values, let's go. I've got 131.5 watts on cut out of 150. That's with intolerance. And out of 60 watts, I have 58, 58 watts, 58.1. Okay, let's take it down one more. Half value, 75 and 30. Did I do that? Yeah. Okay, I've got 75 watts and I'm measuring 70.9. So about 71 watts, very within tolerance. In coag, I got 28.6 out of 30. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. So the customer stated that they were at 50 watts. Let's go ahead and take it down to 50. Let's take coag up to 50. I have 48.7, that's really good. Coag, I have 47.3, 47.5, well within tolerance. Okay, so uh, that goes to show you, cut and coag, it knows where it's at, it's accurate. Now well, let's go ahead and let's set this guy up for bipolar. Okay guys, we got the bipolar set up up here. It's so simple on the old 454 alpha. On your RF input and your return, both those leads come down here. And I know I don't have the best leads, but I'm gonna do with what I got. 
This is just a rough estimate. Uh, so anyway, our bipolars are connected. We're connected here. That means now we have to use the foot control. My uh, ESU analyzer set at 50 ohms, and we're currently set on bipolar cut. So at 50 ohms, I have 44.7, around 45 watts. Switch over to coag. Look at that, I got 50, I'm at 45.5, solid. And one of the things that you should know is it's very linear, the output. So as far as I can tell, this machine knows exactly where it's at on its output. So let's take it down about half value. We're at 30 and this guy's still set. Let's go ahead and run it. Bipolar coag, we're at 27.2 out of 30. Switch to cut. And I've got 44.6 out of 50. We're still within spec on bipolar cut. So bipolar seems to be functioning good. So uh, let's check it again. Bipolar 30, well within spec. We got 27.3. Um, bipolar cut, we're at 26.6 out of 30. Let's take it down one more time. Let's take it down to 15 watts. You can see it's got different values. 15, 15, 15. Okay, let's run. Uh, bipolar coag, 15 watts. Very constant. I like that. So we're at 13.5 out of 15, bipolar cut. Beautiful, we got 14 watts out of 15 on bipolar cut. So this guy is absolutely fine. We're not running through every single step that they want you to do. Uh, and the estimates for uh, the tolerance, you know, we're just doing it really quickly to verify that this machine is technically safe. Now this machine, I do believe, is never going to be put into service again, uh, but they just want to make sure that the machine itself is functioning correctly for legal reasons. So all of these outputs are going to be written down and they're going to be compiled into a nice little report. So uh, one of the last things that we are going to check is we're going to check the RF leakage. So let me go ahead and hook it up for RF leakage and we'll get back to you. Okay guys, so next we are going to go ahead and test the RF leakage on this ESU. And in order to do that on the 454, there is an RF leakage button. Let's go ahead and press it. And uh, now you have to select what type of electrode you're using. We're using the dispersive electrode first. So we have our ground point connected to the back of the chassis. And I have this fancy little yellow guy going to my active electrode. And it's connected to here. So we are actually measuring between the chassis and here how much electricity wants to migrate between the two, that is your RF electricity uh, leakage. So we are on dispersive, we are good. Let's go ahead and let's see. We're at the maximum settings, we've got 300 watts, we have 120 watts and we have 50 watts on the bipolar. So we could just play the piano between all three of them to get our checks. So let's do it, we're on cut. There we go. All right, let's do this. So let's take it down to 200 ohms on the closed electrode. And let's go ahead and let's run it. I got the 300, the 120, and the 100, and the 50 watts on bipolar. Okay. Nothing. And we've got nothing. That's probably a good thing we have nothing on the patient return. Okay, so let's go ahead to the electrode. Let's select active electrode. Oh, actually, in order to do this test, I do need this guy to be just dingle hoppering. And let's connect my pencil. All right, so the pencil, I'm going to connect my pencil to, yep. And let's do the same exact game. Nathan. 
Okay, that's probably a good thing I'm not getting anything. My ground is good. You're definitely good. Okay, and then we switch this guy to the next port. All right, and then we have to switch over to the bipolar. And let's see, do I have bipolar leads? Yes, I do. Okay. Excellent. And for this one here, we're going to connect to one of the two leads, and then we'll switch it. Nothing. And switch it on this guy. We have nothing. All right. So we have no RF leakage whatsoever over on this unit here. Um, this unit is good. It checks out. Now, it could use a little bit of calibration, which is one of the things that we'll do to put it back closer to spec. And uh, the other thing that we've noticed is that uh, on this port right here, I do not have coag. That's probably a disconnect on the inside. I will check that out. We'll see what's going on with that. But when it comes to leakage and when it comes to its output energy, it's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. And the other thing that we checked out was the flow controls. The flow controls are working perfectly. So they uh, do not experience any sort of disconnect or false activation. The electrodes seem to be working fine. Okay, so this ESU here, it is probably never gonna be put back into service ever again. It is discontinued and it's no longer supported by the manufacturer, but uh, we have proven that the equipment itself is not at fault for probably what happened to this clinician. Just as what it is. Sometimes things just happen and we can't explain it, but this equipment is doing what it is supposed to be doing within reason. So guys, uh, that is an incident investigation. Mind you, it's a truncated version. Uh, next, I'm going to do this off camera and we're gonna hook it up with all these analyzers and we're gonna actually break down all the settings and uh, that way there we can compile our report. But you can see the rough process that we have to do. Uh, it's basically like doing a PM, except there's gonna be a lot more physical inspections and writing every single little thing that we notice that's wrong, that's gonna be in the report. And then we compile that and we give it to the customer. So guys, thank you for watching. That's an incident investigation with my trusty little ConMed Excalibur Plus PC, hardworking ESU, plenty of them still in the field. But uh, guys, they're workhorses and they tolerate a lot of abuse. I didn't really think it was going to be at fault on this one. There are other conditions in the room that we have to explore. What type of electrical system did they have? Did they have isolated power? Did they have regular power? Whereas a split phase or Edison system, if they did, there is a potential that there's a grounding issue. The surgical table is also now in question because the surgical table could have leaked electricity just as easily as the ESU to create a burn. So when you're talking between a grounded patient and you have a grounded clinician and there's something moving between the two and now there's a burn, well, that means that you have movement of electricity or the utensil could have been hot too. So that's the other thing that we don't know. Was the utensil physically warm? Because in, in a hospital environment, it could be chilled. So if they just were picking up a nitrogen sponge or something, it could be a uh, freezer burn, or it could be temperature warm burns uh, if they just took it out of a water bath or something like that. We don't know. There's a lot of we don't knows. We do know this guy here is doing his job just fine. Thanks for watching, guys.